Welcome and bienvenidos to our new program called Next Generation, highlighting the many creative journeys of next generation leaders. In this series, I will bring you the stories of young leaders in science, literature, medicine, education, and business. Those who have chosen to reach further, travel farther, innovate, and take the risks often necessary to make a difference in their own lives, in those of their families, their communities, and someday in the world. My name is Julieta Garcia. For over 22 years, I had the great privilege of serving as president of the University of Texas at Brownsville. Through that work, I came to know the stories of many of our students that overcame great obstacles to attend college and through great sacrifice of their own and of their families, make it through. Getting to know their stories was always a great inspiration to me. So I thought I'd chase some of them down, interview them, and let you hear in their own words what they're up to now, what their challenges were, and what they hope to accomplish in the future. I promise you will be as inspired, amazed, and humbled by their accomplishments as I have been. Now let's get started. It is a great privilege this morning to be able to welcome Dr. Alma Solis to our studios here. Welcome, Dr. Solis. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Solis came uh, to be uh, on our campus for this interview, but also to speak to our students from Washington, D.C. And so we're very, very fortunate to be able to bring her home uh, to talk to a next generation of leaders about her own leadership. So, Almita, thank you very, very much for giving of your time and your energy and of your history to inspire the next generation. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right, Alma. So we start out in Brownsville. You were a student here before you became a big shot in Washington, <laughs> D.C. So tell us a little bit about your family and your background. Um, well, um, I my family and and I grew up in in Brownsville, Texas, just down the street from the university. I went to uh, J.T. Canales Elementary School and then to Falk Junior High, and then I graduated from the last uh, graduating class of Brownsville High School in 1974. And at that point, I had to make a decision as to where to go to school. And um, I got a lot of letters from a lot of universities, and I decided to stay at TSC. Uh, Texas Southmost College uh, for my first two years, and it was the best thing I ever did because I discovered science, biology, and it was just amazing for me uh, to do, to to see something different. Um, you started out as an English major, as I recall. I, I was. I was an English major. I just loved my English courses at TSC. I just, I just, that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, and then Um, I had a friend who said she wanted to join Gorgas Science Society, but she didn't want to go by herself. And would I go with her? And I went, and I'm the one who got who ended up in science. Um, and what was Gorgas Science Society? So Gorgas Science Society was a, a, a it was just like a club uh, for students in uh, who were interested in biology or science, and um, and they held these. Um, they used to have these trips to Rancho del Cielo in northwestern Me- in northeastern Mexico, um, and I remember. I want to tell a little story here, that in those days, um, you ha- your parents had to sign a permission slip, even though you were, you know, nineteen age, years old, right? <laughs> and uh, my father wouldn't sign that to let me go for just like three or four days, and. Um, he just wouldn't sign it, and he ran into a friend of his who was a coach at the, at the at uh, in one of the high schools, and his daughter had been down there, and he started to explain how Barbara Warburton was in charge of this prop, prop of of this whole event, and that uh, the there was very good a very good who was a very good chaperone and would make sure that nothing would happen to me and uh, yes I was going into the wilds of Mexico but uh, that everything would be okay and he came home and he said okay I'm going to sign it so that's how you got permission and that's how I got permission oh my yeah. and my I still remember my first trip there it was for 4 days uh in the month of October uh in nine, let's see in 1974 actually oh and goodness. uh Anyway, um, it just opened up my eyes. I'd never been in a place. It was a wonderful cloud forest. It was just amazing. It's about 4,000 feet up right, in about the mountains. Four, right, right. Right. Yeah. Of the Sierra Madre, the, right? Right. And the, mm-hmm. the, the cacophony of the birds, the, the tall trees, the clouds moving in. It was just amazing. And uh, that, 
that turned me around really into, to, well, turned me into science, basically. And so you've never looked back. I never looked back. You go to the Folgers Theater to to get your English fix every once in a while. <laughs> That's I'm true. Sure. I go up to I, I I go to Shakespeare, Shakespeare plays there. Yes, yeah, still. We need to work all sides of the brain. <laughs> so you you ended up majoring in biology, and from TSC and your wonderful experiences in the field, uh, which is very rare for a, a freshman and sophomore student in science. So you had already been in the field in in, a, in an ancient forest in the mm-hmm. mountains of Mexico. Um, and from here then, where did you go? So then I went to the University of, of Texas um, because there was no four years. There were no, the second two years just didn't exist in Brownsville. Mm-hmm. So I had to go away, and, uh, go away, and I went to UT um, Austin. And I remember walking into like a counselor's office, and they said, but you have all these science courses, and you say you're an English major? <laughs> I said, yes. They said, well, have you ever thought about going into science? And I said, well, I said... Okay, well, let's go for it. <laughs> and um, but I was definitely going to go into education. My father had, who um, who didn't uh, go to school for very long. I mean, he had probably a sixth grade education. Um, always had always pushed uh, me being a teacher because that was his experience of an education. And so I went into the secondary science education program at UT Austin. And uh, so I did science courses and I did education courses. And I got a really good grounding on how to teach science from them. And um, But then I decided that I wanted to go to do a master's degree. And this is where it got a little complicated because my father couldn't understand it. You know why was no acabas, mija? <laughs> no, no. It was why no. aren't you coming home um, uh, to teach? To teach, get married, have kids. You know yeah, the whole thing, of course. And um, and they happened to my parents were returning something to Barbara Warburton, and she told them she I don't I wasn't there because I was in Austin, but she told them that uh, explained to them why it was important that I continue on with my education. And so after that, it was easier with my dad. Uh, my mother was amazing. She always said, just keep going. Do what you want to do. And so um, so then I came back from UT Austin. I told Barbara Warburton that I wanted to go to graduate school. And she said, well, what are you interested in? I said, well, I'm really interested in plants and, uh, you know, this kind of thing. And and she said, because um, I had had a a wonderful course at UT Austin on plant systematics or the classification of plants with uh, Dr. Johnson. I can't remember his first name, but he wrote The Plants of Texas. Anyway, (laughs) uh, I said this to her and she said, uh, well, let me, she said, you ought to be working with Dr. Larry Gilbert in the, in the zoology department. And I said, well, I I don't, I'm not really interested in animals, but let's, I'm going to go talk to him. (laughs) So she called him up and told him that I was going to come I was going to contact him and ask for an appointment to see him. So I went over there, and uh, Dr. Larry, because I was being um, recommended by Barbara Warburton, who who knew, I mean, he knew her, um, he immediately gave me an appointment, and I went to talk to him, mm-hmm. and he said, well, have you thought about plant insect interactions? And I said, no, not really. He said, well, you know, you could come and study with me because I work on butterflies and what they and the plants they feed on. So I said, okay, well, let's let's try that. There was the bridge. Then, right, from, that was the bridge. From botany to zoology. Right, so I did have a, uh, for my master's, I had Dr. Beryl Simpson in the botany department, and I had, um, and then I had in the, uh, in the zoology department, I had Dr. Larry Gilbert. And um, then it was decided that I was going to do my research at Rancho del Cielo for my master's degree. And Larry Gilbert said at the time, well, you ought to be working on leaf mining moths. <laughs> because? So, so, well, because um, uh, uh, he showed me this study that had been done in California by Dr. Paul Oppler on, uh, on what species of leaf mining moths. These are caterpillars that are so tiny, they mine the leaves and all you can see is the mines on the leaf. The, the caterpillars are so tiny. And uh, this way you can study the evolution and speciation between northeastern Mexico and 
Eastern U.S. Which would be very unique. Right. And for graduate work, you have to find a unique niche, don't you? Right. And so I did that. So I spent by myself. I was uh, two and a half months the first year uh, rearing leaf mining moths. And then the second. Where was this? At Rancho del Cielo. At Rancho del Cielo. Yeah. So I was there by myself. And let me tell you, that's very character building. (laughs) <laughs> because Rancho del Cielo what took just to get up there from Gomez Farias, which was right right outside of Ciudad Victoria, right. but to go up right. to Rancho del Cielo took how many hours by truck? Uh, I think it took a couple of hours, but there's no electricity. Right. It's all done with butane and... And no running water. No running water. There are cisterns. Right. Cisterns, or, right. There are outhouses. Uh-huh. There's, you see, there's no television, no radio in those days. And, of course, now I'm sure, I don't know if there's cell phone uh, contact there. There but is, there is. There barely, is. Yeah, yeah, but barely. they're there. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, so, it, but it it was just having all these gadgets. It's, it's the, I had never been truly alone by myself. And so the first three days were really hard because you'd hear a noise and you'd rush out to see what it was. And, uh, and usually it was just the wind. You know, or squirrels on the ceiling, or bats in the roof, um, and so it. I think it helped me build an incredible character and courage to be alone, which a lot of people don't have that opportunity. I was very lucky, and uh, so then, so then I did all this work, and then I got back and. And Very lucky. Not many people would say how lucky to <laughs> spend. I spent one night by myself at Rancho del Cielo. Thought I was like the queen of the world right. because I had survived by myself <laughs> one night. So you spent several months. months. Yeah, right. that's that's extraordinary. two times. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so uh, there is where where this blossom, this right. interest right. in these moths, moths occurred. Exactly. Okay. In general, moths in general. Yeah, and. Um, and so, but what I got back, and it's sort of like, well, I said, to, I said to uh, Dr. Gilbert, I said, well, see, gee, Larry, I said, you know, I can't. F- there's no books. There's nothing to tell me what these species are. He says, well, Alma, you're going to have to go to the Smithsonian for that. <laughs> Is that where that occurred? <laughs> That's what happened. Oh my goodness! So he was off in Costa Rica, and they were offering some um, funds at the University of Texas Department of Biological Sciences at the time uh, to. They were called, I think, subvention funds. And I applied for it and got another <laughs> professor to sign off for me. And I got the money. So I was able to go up to Washington for three days. And I went up there with my little moths, my boxes of moths. <laughs> and um, it was amazing. Uh, they all just came out of their offices. They'd never seen moths. Now, from they the, would be scientists? Scientists at the Natural History Museum. Okay, because there the, are many Smithsonian museums, right? Right. But this it's, would be the Natural History Museum. Which is where I work now, but uh, Isn't that that's that's lovely? further that's further down the road. I mean, I didn't know that at the time. Full circle. Yeah. And uh, later, I was told that that was one of the best things I ever did to actually show up. That a lot of people would, in those days would write letters or make phone calls, but to actually show up was a big deal. And so you showed up and you showed them your moths, right? And why was that such a big deal? Well, it's a very unique area where nobody, none of the scientists there had ever seen moths from that area, and that's it. That place is the northernmost distribution for many species from the tropics. Rancho del Cielo is yes. right, and then from the uh, southernmost distribution from the United States South. So that's an interface zone for science, Correct. right? For, for Neartic and neotropical yes. uh, distributions. So you see plants and animals living together that normally don't occur in together. nature together. Correct. Correct. Because, and that interface zone, uh, I think, is one of the analogies I use often for us growing up in the valley, a cultural, economic, uh, that's language interface zone. But, right. but now in science, this is a really big, big deal. deal. Yes. Yeah. So everybody was really happy and they were just amazed. And while I was there, I had a, a one of the scientists, his name was Dr. Ronald Hodges, said, you know, can I speak to you later? And I went in to talk to him and he spent two hours. But he started out by asking, have you ever thought about getting a, a PhD in systematics? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> and so he explained to me what schools I could go to, who I could work with. Um, and uh, uh, and he basically just laid it all out for me so that all I had to do was make a decision. And um, When did you make the decision to go on and work on the doctorate? 
uh, well, that summer. So at mm-hmm. the end of the conversation, I said, well, I said, you know, I would love to go into this, but I would really like to come and work with you for the summer, you know, to work on my moths from Rancho del Cielo. And he said, they said, well, you have more? I said, yes, I have more. Aww. And uh, they said, well, we'll see what we can do. So they these were USDA scientists who got me a Smithsonian fellowship. So USDA is the United States. States Department of Agriculture. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's... There, in the in the Natural History Museum, there are scientists from many different government agencies who do a lot of work uh, that's needed for their particular agency, and um, and so they they got me a fellowship, Smithsonian fellowship, uh, to come there for the summer and work with them, and then when I was there, it was sort of, well, where are you going to go to school? And I said, well, if you go to the University of Maryland, you can work with us. I said, well, absolutely. So I went for an, because how close is University of Maryland? It's about thirty to, minutes. Yeah, it's right down the road. Right, and they had just hired a new young systematist called Dr. Charlie Mitter, and um, so you were on your way. Yeah, so he interviewed me wow. and accepted me, and those guys already knew me, and um, I I got a four year fellowship to the University of Maryland uh, that they all signed off on and recommended me for. So tell me, a fellowship means. You get a scholarship. Do they Correct. pay your tuition? They Is paid for stipend? tuition. They paid me a stipend. They paid for my books. Even I mean, wow, it was amazing. It was powerful. an amazing fellowship. Yeah, and um, sponsored by USDA. You know, well, no, it was sponsored, sponsored by, by um, uh, who? Who originally? Where did that money come from? It came through the University of Maryland, basically. Ah. Yes, right. because they were they are known for science and math and pulling in students. Right. And especially also they were looking for a diverse student body as right. well. Right. You meet all criteria. You had right. independent research already moving. You had experience with USDA and connects there. Yeah. And a young Latina didn't look bad on their Oh books sure it didn't. <laughs> no, no. How magnificent. So then you stayed there then for a while, worked on your Ph.D. I did. And the last three years of my Ph.D., the USDA hired me half time as an entomologist. So when entomologist, entomologist, word for okay, us today. entomologist. So what is that? An entomologist is, stu- is a person who studies insects. OK. And um, that's what you are. That's what I am. To exactly. this day. To this day, I am. We ask, okay. what, are, what do you do? Yeah. You are a research entomologist. Correct. Which uh-huh. means you continue to do research then in the field. Right. And and is the there lab. anything to discover? I mean, have you discovered it all already or is there? Well, there's so much. There is so much. Uh, I, As a research scientist, I am also curator of the national collection of the group of moths that I work on, which are the Pyroloidia. You are America's curator is yeah. how it's. Fa- now, I am I mean, America's curator. You're America's curator of this particular, particular kind of snout m- moth. Correct. That's extraordinary. So, so y- that's like your job title in many ways. Right? I have I have curator as one of my job titles. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. so. Yeah. So, what does that mean when when someone discovers this, what they think might be a snout moth in in a entry port to the United right. States okay. and they can't identify it. Right. So that's one of the major parts of my job is that a little bit, between 11.30 and 1 every day <laughs> we wait for a shipment of moths or di- now digital photos of moths that are uh, caterpillars usually that have been intercepted at U.S. all U.S. sports. We're talking 300 plus sports. And um, so they have we and they, why do you, why do you have to inspect them when they find them? What's the well, what are the issues? Oh well, because a lot of the pests, uh, a lot of well, there's sixteen thousand described species in the world. Most of them do not occur in the United States, and a lot of them are potential invasive species or pests in this country. And we do have a history of this. A number have already made it in. And um, and what happens when they come into the United States? So they they start to eat the native plant species, and whether it's a crop or a tree, they can completely devastate. It's sort of like the gypsy moth. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't work on the gypsy moth, but mm-hmm. um, I have other. There are other species that I work on, like uh, the European corn borer that attacks corn crops in the United so States. They, so your job is to identify any invasive species? Potential. Potential. In, right. So, and then stop them from coming in? Well, I don't stop them. No, no. I just tell the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service uh-huh. 
that that species does not occur in the United States, mm. that there that it's related to other potentially um, invasive, invasive yeah. species. And so that's all I do. I mean, the job is so huge. Um, that they decide. They decide what they need to. Whether or not to. To mitigate Intercept it. and right. mitigate. Right. And, and they, they're the ones that decide what the action is. I remember you telling a story a long time ago about your dad um, who wanted you to come back to Brownsville badly. Mm-hmm. And there was a job at the customs or somebody right. on the bridge and doing similar kinds of things, inspecting, not not what you're doing, but yeah. but with identifying that, that kind of first level first identifier, level. Yeah. right? And and he said something like, Mijita, can, can you do that? <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, Dad, I can do that a lot more. <laughs> yeah. He said, then good, you can yeah. come and apply yeah. for this job. Yeah. That wasn't in your plan, of life's work. So, so let's now fast forward a little bit. Um, uh, you now are living in Washington, D.C., have lived there for quite a while, are married. Since the 80s, yes. Yeah, since the 80s. Yeah. Okay, so your new home or your second home is D.C. And tell us... Uh, now, what you're doing with with uh, with the USDA and with the museum, and and about your other kind of stop off points in between. Well, there isn't very much. You spend a lot of time working with um, on the same group of insects for your PhD. You're completely inundated that in that for years, and um, and then in 1986, I was hired as an entomologist. I think I said and. I was hired to curate parts of the collection and to to learn about uh, the morphology of caterpillars. You can't go to school for that. It's on the job learning. And then three years and later, morphology refers, refers to... to the structures, the mm-hmm. characters that define. It's it's like looking at your nose and what kind of nose you have. That's that kind of thing. And. Um, but in this case, it's caterpillar noses. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so yeah, then um, I was hired. I, w- I defended my dissertation on Friday, and I was hired by USDA on a Monday. So now, okay, so you have had this magnificent career. You've been, you've received a tremendous amount of recognition um, uh, for, for, me- for much of your work. Um, you became president of a group in Washington also, it was at the uh, Entomological Society of Washington. Washington and the Washington Biologist Field Club. And, and was that a rare thing for a woman entomologist? Uh, well, to of be course, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> there, there are not that many women in entomology, and uh, not uh, that many. No. I mean, how many women do you think in your field at that level? Well, in it DC? depends upon how you define field. I mean. Okay. Um, um, the number of women who work on moths worldwide is probably less than 10. Less than 10 worldwide. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. now we're narrowing the field <laughs> quite a bit. Right. So for you to become president of this group was really quite an extraordinary yeah. moment. No, it was... And often I'm sure you found yourself as the woman, the woman entomologist, right. the woman scientist yeah. in that field. Yeah. 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 So I'm also president of the Washington – I was president of the Washington Biologists Field Club, which is about 60 – Member has only sixty members. You have to be nominated and you have to be elected into it, and um, it's a hundred years old. And I was its first woman president, <laughs> and, and that came out in the Washington Post. That was in the Washington Post. And why did it come out in the Post? Because in previous uh, article, they had been um, criticized for not having any women in the club ah. and being... So they were um, going to show you off now. <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, anyway, so they that's the, basically what that's the great. article was about, was yeah. about breaking that barrier. And I wasn't the first female president. In fact, I was asked if I wanted to be nominated, and I said there were a number of older women who deserved to be, older than me, mm-hmm. who deserved to be nominated first. And so they were nominated first, and then I was I came in a little later. Um mm-hmm. But uh, I was the first woman elected, and they elected me while I was on my honeymoon in Tobago. Ah, <laughs> to another scientist. And yes. I understand Jason's your uh, your sweetheart and husband, yeah. and is also um, he works on butterflies. He works on butterflies. So yeah. there was an NPR story about your matchup. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, right. And it was referring to the fact that you studied moths, he studied butterflies, and and what a nice and rare. 
combination. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you have your own butterfly garden now with your That's sweet correct. Garden, yeah. That's what the NPR um, program was supposed to be about. But then the uh, writer <laughs> called me. We were in Florida scuba diving. She called me and said, the article's going to come out tomorrow. And I'm sorry to say that my editor decided it was supposed to be a uh, human Interest, human interest stories, story. <laughs> said about your garden. And I said, "Oh, okay. Well, what Either can way. I do?" Well, yes. there, it's yeah. both. It yeah. is both. Okay, yeah. so now um, you have been in administrative positions. You've been mm-hmm. in in pure research positions at the bench. You've been a field biologist and entomologist. Um, you're a married lady. You're your daughter, um, and a prima, and a friend, and many colleagues. And today you're coming to speak uh, to students also. So let me just take one last moment with you mm-hmm. um, to ask if you could give advice. If we had 50 students here in front of you mm-hmm. and they were trying to figure out whether I should go into this field or not, what advice would it, would you give them? I think it's very, very important to follow what you're passionate about. You have to be particularly in science, you have to be very passionate because, yes, it sounds very exciting, but the fact is that a lot of the basic work that I do is is tedious to get to an answer. You have to know, you have to learn how to ask the right questions and then to learn how to develop the, the uh, method to be able to answer those questions. And you have to be very passionate about it. And not only that, it'll make you a happier person if you do follow something you're passionate about. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Adma, for joining us here, for lending us your story, um, and for always opening doors for others uh, along the way, because you've done your own share of that, and I'm sure we'll continue to do that. It's been a real pleasure to have you here at our studio. Felicidades. Thank you for representing us all so well. Muchas gracias. Hasta pronto. Thank you for tuning in to Next Generation, a program highlighting the next generation of leaders in the Rio Grande Valley and beyond. Thank you.